Gypsy Smith's Best Sermons, as delivered in Brooklyn, and published in book form by arrangement with the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. Copyright, 1907. Publisher's Prefix In issuing Gypsy Smith's sermons in a handy form for general circulation, we believe we are doing a good work, as never since the memorable days of Moody and Sankey have the hearts and lives of people been stirred, as they have by these sermons as delivered in Brooklyn. We are under special obligation to the Brooklyn Daily Eagle for permission to print them in book form. The Publisher Gypsy Smith's Best Sermons The Story of Gypsy Smith From a gypsy wagon to a pe- preacher's pulpit is a long cry. Few realize the expense measured physically or psychologically. To those who have heard Gypsy Smith, the sole gasping evangelist, the transition seems a natural one. For those few who know his true story, there are written between the words of his appeals, for light a history, a romance, a tragedy of life. A strong, well-developed man, with black, wavy hair, black mustache, large, dark eyes with flash, with defiancy or melt with tenderness, clearly defined, clean-cut, bold features. A face now gentle, now yielding. A face filled with that indescribable dash of the Orient. A voice now soft and mellow, now stringent, almost fierce. A quick, warm grasp of the hand, an unspoken token of brotherhood. A mutual surrender that is the sum total of a meeting with Gypsy Smith. In his room in the hotel the other day, he came forward to his visitor with his arms extended. He had hastily arisen from a low chair by a table on which a Bible was spread wide open. His greeting was easy and natural. It was full of welcome and cordiality. It was filled with a pointed personality that one seemed to feel was directed exclusively to him. Barely was the greeting over when there was a sharp ring on the telephone. In an instant, the receiver was at the evangelist's ear. Yes, yes, beloved, said he. And then, in a moment again, very well, beloved. Goodbye, beloved. There was a softness in the voice that seemed like the gentleness of a woman. And yet that night, when he almost leaped before the silent audience that crowded Plymouth Church to its capacity, with his right hand thrust into his waistcoat, tugging, pulling, struggling with an imaginary full at his heart, crying, Drag out the sin, drag it out, drag it out by the hair of the head. The glowing enthusiasm in full control of him, the religious ecstasy in full possession of his soul made manifest a zeal within the man's breast that needed but a breath to blow it into a living flame. You have had wide experience in the evangelical line, began his visitor. Tell me if the emotional convert is a lasting convert. Does the conversion sink deep into his heart? He moved forward on the edge of his chair. He spread out his hands, palm downward before him. If you take bricks and sand, said he, with his eyes half closed, and leave out the mortar, you cannot build a wall that will stand. Now, in this work of conversion, you have to deal with a man's intelligence, his conscience, and his emotions. His intelligence and his conscience are the brick and sand. The mortar is his emotions, his heart. Without the mortar, you cannot build your wall. Without the emotion, without touching and reaching into the heart of your man, you cannot build your Christian. He leaned back in his chair with his hands upon his knees. Since I have been in Brooklyn at this time, he continued, Men and women have come to me and told me that I converted them eighteen years ago, and that during all these years they have been steadfast in the faith. All through my trip in the West I met many such men and women. They came to me eighteen years ago and professed Christ. Some of the men have become preachers, and so it is all over England. Wherever I go I find these men and women, whom I converted, earnest, devoted, lasting Christians. They have builded with bricks and sand and mortar. He bent forward with his arms upon the table, his hands on the open pages of the Bible. When the Spirit of the Lord takes possession of one, he said, it fills him, it fills his heart to overflowing. His love comes out. It comes out for you and for me. It is a lasting love. It is an emotional love, an emotional love that endures. He strengthened up. 
He closed his fist tightly and brought it down upon the Bible. Endures forevermore. Quickly he lowered his voice. Quickly he smiled. That, beloved, said he, is emotional religion. Here in this brief interval was outlined the entire method of the man's work. In your meetings, asked the visitor, do you yourself give away to your emotions? Yes, was the answer. I become part of the meeting. I become a part of the audience. I am merged into it. We are one. And in the beginning, oh, beloved, in the beginning, in the beginning of the meeting, I look over my audience. I watch all the people. I get in touch with them. I study them. And then, in a general way, I block out what I am going to say to them. Now, it is not so much what you say as how you say it. I have known other speakers to express the same thoughts that I express, but in different language, and their remarks have made the people angry, while mine have not. But in the beginning of the meeting, I form a plan of campaign as I sit there on the platform and watch the people. I can generally tell, after the first song or two, just what temper the audience is in. And then I regulate myself accordingly. Sometimes I make my hearers angry. I know I'm going to make them angry, and oft times I tell them so. But I go right ahead, nevertheless. I tell them the plain truth, and then I try to touch their hearts. I try to reach their emotions. I get their sympathies. There is a bond between us. Their hearts soften, and my heart softens too. I, too, am affected. I give out my whole soul to them. My energies, my life, my being, seem to ooze out at the very fingertips. I give the best that is in me. I feel the response from the people. Our hearts are talking. I reach the height of my discourse. Our hearts are close together. They are one. And then I am exhausted. Strong man that I am, I have become weak. I go to my room. I lay on my bed. I sleep. Sometimes, he continued, and his voice was lowered, sometimes I am so tired that I drop on the bed without first kneeling down and praying. And then my daughter comes to me, my daughter Zilla, the gypsy girl, and she puts her arms around my neck and says, Why, Daddy, Daddy, you haven't said your prayers. And I say, Daughter, I've been praying all day to the Lord. But there are times, resumed Gypsy Smith, when I must rest. And then that season for rest comes... I go into the forest and into the fields. I get close to nature. And the old spirit of the gypsy comes back to me. He closed his eyes. Perhaps the vision of the gypsy wagon, the gypsy tent, the campfire was before him. Perhaps he walked again under the arches of the green leaves. Perhaps he plucked again the wild flowers. In those few seconds, perhaps the romance of the centuries of the gypsy life came before him. Perhaps he heard the love song of the gypsies as his ancestors heard it in these hundreds of years ago. O love, come over the water, O love, wherever you be, my own sweet heart, my darling, come over the river to me. In a moment the vision had passed. My first sermon, Gypsy Smith reported the query. Ah, my first sermon, said he with a smile, was delivered in the turnips in the field. I talked to the trees, I talked to the stones, I talked to the birds. I was between sixteen and seventeen years old when the desire came upon me to be a preacher. My father had become a Christian. The light came to him at my mother's death. He was left alone with five small children, and parting words of my mother were, Take care of the little ones. Beloved, take care of our children. And there was my father, a big, strong man, who, without a Bible, without a teacher, without a guiding hand, without knowing how to read or write, came to God. This story of our father's conversion leads him back to England. There, in Ethling Forest, Gypsy Smith, called by his parents Rodney Smith, was born in 1860 in a gypsy tent. The place is 15 miles east of London. He was the fourth child. Two were born after, one of whom died soon after the death of the mother. It was the death of our mother that changed the whole course of our lives, said Gypsy Smith. My father was a tinker. He mended tinware, re-canned chairs, made willow baskets and clothes pegs, and my mother, and afterwards we children, sold his wares. This occupation of my father had been handed down to him through many generations. 
He also, like all gypsies, was a horse trader and a gypsy horse trader, as you perhaps know, is thoroughly expert in that business. The women told fortunes. There are probably between 20,000 to 25,000 gypsies in the British Isles. About 80% of the gypsies have biblical names. My father's name was Cornelius and my brother's Ezekiel. The twelve children of my uncle Bartholomew all had scriptural names, like Naomi, Samson, Delilah, Elijah, etc. Yet there were no Bibles among the gypsies. How did we get those names? Did they come to us from tradition? Are we one of the lost tribes? I believe we are akin to the Hebrew race, but no one knows our origin. Our tribes have been traced back to India, but it's believed we went to India from somewhere else. It were simply nomads there, as we have been nomads in all parts of the world. The Gypsy language? Little of the ancient Gypsy language is spoken today. Now and then a word prevails, but for the most part a corrupt English is spoken by the Gypsies in England, at least. Here it may be said that the dialects of the ancient Gypsies were as varied as the jargons of the African natives, but the roots of each family branch, whether of American or European stock, show a common origin. Well, it is not indisputable. The best authorities point to the Arians, A-R-Y-N, as the earliest races. Whether sprung this most remarkable language, but the origin of the Romanian tongue is so old that it is lost in the uh, Arian record, and doubtless belongs to the prehistoric caste. All we know about the gypsy and his ancestry is that in the 10th to the 12th centuries, India threw out a vast multitude of troublesome indwellers, and among them were the Jats, J-A-T-S, whom many maintain constitute the main stock of the gypsies. The very name Romanian, R-O-M-A-N-Y, doubtless came from one of the lowest castes that still exists in India and is known as D-O-M. The word probably haven't been corrupted into R-O-M. We lived as other gypsies lived, continued Gypsy Smith. We roamed from place to place. My father loved my mother. She loved him. They both loved their children. The ties of love bound us all closely together. You must know the gypsy character is one of love and tenderness. The gypsies marry young. Their sweethearts are among their own people. There is a high regard for virtue among the gypsies. The courtship of a young gypsy couple is always conducted in the presence of the maiden's mother or an older person. Their walks are taken with this older person. The romance grows in the strict propriety. Thus the wife and husband continue to be lovers. Thus it was with my father and mother. There was my father, a gypsy without education or religion, no better, no worse than other gypsies. For his recreation he played the fiddle, and sometimes he turned this pastime to profit, a profit that worked to his detriment. For in the public houses where he played, oft times taking me with him to collect the coins, he drank more beer than was good for him. But the climax came to our lives, the climax that changed us all. We were traveling in our wagon through Hertfordshire, England, when my sister, the eldest of the family, was taken ill. We drove up to the doctor's house. He said, It is smallpox. You must go away from here. We went to a by place called Norton Lane. There my father pitched our tent, where he left my mother and the four other children. The wagon he took 200 yards or more away, and there we went with the sick child, when, whom he nursed and cared for. In a few days, my brother Ezekiel was taken down with small, smallpox, and he too was sent to the wagon. My mother carried the food she had prepared for the invalids halfway between the wagon and the tent, when she would call for my father. Sometimes he was busily engaged with his little charges, and the snow would get on the food, and my mother, in her anxiety for her children, we get nearer and nearer to the wagon, and one day she, too, had smallpox. There in the forest was Gypsy Smith's father, with his dying wife and little children. With no knowledge of the Bible and little knowledge of God, he reached out to the dying woman. Do you believe in God? he asked. Yes, asked the woman. Do you try to pray, beloved? he asked. I try to, answered the woman, and sometimes there is a voice that says to me that there is no mercy for me. 
The woman put her arms around his neck and kissed him. He went outside and wept, and he heard her singing, I have a father in the promised land. My God calls me. I must go. I meet him in the promised land. It was a song she had heard twenty years before. It was a song she heard sung by school children. It came to her as her life ebbed out. I shall never forget, said Gypsy Smith, with his face in his hands, that day my father came to me and said, Rodney, you have no mother. That is the first chapter in Gypsy Smith's life story. Let us not dwell on the conversion of his father and the two uncles and the life that led traveling through the country and holding gospel meetings in tents and wagons. Let us not dwell upon the struggles of Cornelius Smith, how he sold his fiddle that led him into temptation in the public houses and the fight he had to remain in the narrow path. Let us not dwell on the conversion of Gypsy Smith in that little Methodist church in Cambridge, England, and his entrance into the Christian mission, of which the Reverend William Booth, now the head of the Salvation Army, was superintendent, and let us not dwell on the work of Gypsy Smith in the Salvation Army. That first chapter in his life that records the death of his mother was the proem and the climax. For thirty years Gypsy Smith had been an evangelist, This is his sixth visit to America. In 1889, he spoke to the Nostrum Avenue Methodist Episcopal Church in Brooklyn for the first time in this country. Since then, he has preached in many towns and many churches in America. End of chapter 1 and 2. Chapter 1 being the prefix. Read by Peter John Parises.